Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Bongi Wamagocha from uh, Botswana. Uh, we welcome you to this session. And uh, maybe briefly before we start, uh, if we look at why we're having this webinar, I guess it's based on the fact that uh, librarians have continuously been advocating for inclusive and equitable access to knowledge and information resources around the world. And then the issue of digital device is commonly a reality, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, where data from the World Bank indicate that inter internet penetration for individual is hovering around 30% of the population. So despite the acceleration digital, digitalization of socialities and economics during the COVID-19 pandemic, Sub-Saharan Africa is still the region with the widest coverage gap. So that is the, uh, the reason why we are having uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, in our panel today, as our panelist, we are having um, Dr. Tom Kwanya from East Africa, and then we are having Dr. Salubi from South African region. And then we are having Mr. Comfort Asare also from West Africa. And then Mr. Atonim Dolphin uh, representing the Francophone Africa. So as a way of starting, uh, we'll have a presentation by Tom Kwanya from the East Africa regarding the topic that I've just explained. Thank you so much. Over to you, Tom. Uh, thank you, moderator. Uh, let me just confirm that you can hear my voice. Anyone, can you hear me? Yes, Prof, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so just one minute, I upload the presentation. Okay. Uh Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, moderator. Uh, thank you, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, who have joined this uh, uh, meeting this afternoon. Um, I'm really uh, privileged to be uh, among you today to be able to um, uh, lead this discussion or make a contribution uh, to the conversations that we'll have this afternoon. I've entitled my presentation, Digital Inclusion in Africa, Role of um, li libraries and information centers. My name is Tom Kwaja, a professor of knowledge management, Technical University of Kenya in Nairobi. And today I hold the mantle of the East African community countries. As a way of introduction, um, I will basically be looking at what role the libraries and information centers together with librarians can or have played in facilitating the realization of uh, AU 2063 agenda of uh, realizing a prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth and sustainable development, meaning no one should be left behind uh, regardless of who they are. And given that uh, digital spaces are um, becoming more serious and mainstreamed in our social and uh, economic development, um, uh, today we'll basically just focus on um, a digital uh, inclusion. Uh, no one should be left out of digital spaces as a means of ensuring that uh, everyone in Africa is able to experience a prosperous uh, environment in which they're able to grow and uh, enjoy the development. Now, um, just a brief of my understanding of what digital inclusion is. Um, uh, really speaking, is ensuring that everyone, or as many as, as, as possible, but the focus is actually everyone, even though practically it may not be possible to attain that, but to ensure that all individuals and communities, including 
the most disadvantaged. Disadvantaged perhaps because of uh, culture, because of gender, because of disability, or wherever else um, a form of, of, of disadvantage that may uh, 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 be, be existing. Yeah, so ensuring that everyone, uh, including both people, have access to information technologies and that they're able to use the same for purposes of making their lives and the lives of those people around them uh, better. So all the activities that are geared towards uh, achieving that goal uh, can be uh, deemed as or termed as uh, digital inclusion. And uh, this is exemplified through a, a number of things. I'm just mentioning a few. One is uh, access to digital tools and infrastructure. So having digital devices that are working, computers, mobile phones, and any other, and that they have uh, the adequate or the requisite infrastructure to use those are exemplified by you know, adequate bandwidth and, uh, and connectivity, and sometimes also including electricity as well. Again, the ability to gainfully use uh, digital tools and infrastructure that relates to the awareness uh, at, uh, awareness of the opportunities that are there and having the competencies that are required for them to be able to use uh, those tools and infrastructure adequately or optimally. Again, the issue of access, uh, cost-effective access and, and use of these digital resources, including content, uh, because it's one thing to have access to say a computer or uh, have access to infrastructure but lack the economic power to use them uh, monies that are required either uh, to pay for licenses or to pay for for bandwidth or even pay for uh, the, the basic uh, things such as electricity uh, because in some cases people have to you know negotiate do i buy airtime uh, or uh, do i buy uh, food the other thing is access to a uh, quality technical support, uh, being able to you know, access. And the issue there is um, localization, uh, being able to get uh, ready access to technical support uh, that enhances the capacities of people to be able to use uh, these tools and infrastructure. There is um, a, a way of uh, presenting this that uh, if you're thinking of this in terms of the major uh, element that is like a three-legged stool, uh, typical in African communities that has three legs. Uh, one is digital literacy, so it's important that we have the skills and um, that uh, we have the tools and also that we have the infrastructure upon which um, our digital tools are able to work and we are able to apply our skills in uh, the literacy. Now, um, I don't, I'm, I'm trying to rush because I think we just have about 15 minutes for me and um, I'm jumping a lot of things and just going into uh, some of the factors or some of the things that uh, would exclude people. Because if we are going to mitigate um, digital exclusion, then we must also be able to identify what causes it. And some of the things are poverty. Poverty is closely related to the economic factors that I talked about earlier. And then there's also lack of digital skills, which is technical illiteracy. And of course, in even uh, the normal uh, literacy, being unable to read and write um, would limit uh, people's ability to utilize uh, resources and digital tools, even if they have them. You know, there are many people uh, in this region that uh, are still illiterate, and that means they can't read, they can't write. And uh, that comes with a lot of ramifications uh, on, on the ability to experience or utilize uh, digital as uh, 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 digital spaces. And to that extent, they are excluded. Inadequate digital infrastructure, of course, good work has been done, uh, fiber optic uh, connections uh, along the eastern coast of Africa, covering most of the countries in the ESC. And so a lot of improvements, yes, but um, still a lot more uh, people are still left out in terms of coverage, particularly those who are in the hinterland, uh, being able to access uh, you know, reliable uh, fiber optic connectivity or even uh, uh, a GSM and, uh, and, and a mobile telephone network sometimes uh, becomes a big challenge, particularly in the remote uh, rural areas. Lack of relevant content, yes. Uh, in this region, we speak Kiswahili mostly. That is what the majority of us speak across the borders. 
but uh, and of course English, but you'll find that uh, the majority of content is um, not in any of those local languages. Uh, of course, if it were possible, it would have been better even to go deeper and uh, and reach the vernaculars uh, because not everyone um, uh, speaks even Kiswahili itself. There are people who perhaps would understand best, uh, you know, the local languages and the content that we have online uh, is largely English, largely English. And that is, uh, you know, a vehicle of exclusion. Of course, that is related to the next point, and I will skip it and talk about gender. Again, there are gender-based uh, inequalities yeah, that uh, would either limit access or otherwise to, uh, particularly to the female gender, and um, you know, maybe ownership, issues of ownership for digital devices, and also the fact that uh, uh, many of the, gen uh, the, the female gender also are busy taking care of uh, families and all, and that limits their, their time that perhaps they can utilize uh, on, on digital spaces. There are issues of intellectual property rights uh, that relate to the technology or technological innovations that um, again, uh, limit uh, access to digital spaces. And of course, lack of awareness, not just about the general issues, but uh, of digital opportunities, opportunities that exist in digital spaces um, as, as, as it were. Now, what are the consequences? So consequences are, are many. One is social exclusion. So it means then that um, uh, people who are excluded in the digital spaces, because a lot of stuff currently happens in digital spaces. So if I am not able to be connected or contribute, then I would have a challenge. I would not be part and parcel of what happens. I would become a passenger, not even a passenger, uh, a passerby, or perhaps uh, someone who's just watching from 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 um, from, from the uh, the fringes. Economic marginalization. A lot is happening now in digital spaces. We talk about the gig economy and uh, the fourth industrial revolution, and a lot of things are happening on uh, on, on digital spaces. And if anyone is not able to access these, then they get limited in terms of economic opportunities uh, that arise out of globalization. Uh, intellectual exclusion, yes, uh, because uh, they are not able to be exposed to what is happening in the rest of the world. And therefore they would not apply themselves, they would not know of the innovations that happen out there. And that is reflected in the, the low number of patents and innovations that come out of our region. A low pace of development, yeah, uh, because if, we are marginalized socially, marginalized uh, uh, economically, marginalized technologically, then uh, the pace of development would, would, would be low, especially because uh, development in the current uh, 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 generation, current era relies a lot <coughs> on um, technology. Perpetual ignorance, yeah. A lot has moved to digital spaces and also birds. And um, anyone who is unable to access uh, the cyberspace, as it were, and digital te technologies and platforms would then be left out of the conversations that happen. And that leads to missed opportunities that uh, ultimately lead to a vicious circle of poverty. And of course, um, bad governance as well, because open data or access to data is critical uh, as a means of uh, civic uh, education or civic awareness. And uh, without information, therefore, uh, people or the citizenry would not be able to hold their governments accountable and get uh, good governance. I will uh, uh, skip that, but uh, so we have internodes uh, as opposed to internodes. And uh, really the first one uh, 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 describes people who are able to technically and, um, and, and, and otherwise use technologies that exist, navigate, uh, digital spaces optimally and internet. Uh, the second one are people who are non-users. So I would say that the majority of the people in Eastern Africa are um, um, a, a large percentage could, could, could actually be internet, but then there are still people who are still lagging behind as internet, uh, the second not. Now, how do you to get this? I increase connectivity uh, through infrastructure development. A lot has happened, as I said, and a lot is still happening, but again, it's not uh, adequate. I reduce the cost of accessing digital tools. Again, governments have um, you know, gone back and forth 
uh, in uh, mitigating costs of uh, digital uh, tools and infrastructure or access to them. But lately, there are issues about taxation that are affecting uh, costs in, in, in certain regimes. And uh, uh, that is affecting uh, uh, access and leading or promoting exclusion. And so that needs to be addressed. Uh, capacity, uh, you'll see in the examples I'll give shortly, that a lot has been happening uh, building digital uh, literacy and also building technical uh, 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 capacities of, of institutions to be able to uh, expand or promote uh, digital literacy and use of digital resources. But again, it's not adequate. Support uh, the development and access of local content. Again, uh, this I think is the, the worst uh, in terms of other, other challenges that we are having. Not much exists uh, in Kiswahili and other local languages as opposed to English, I think is an area that if you have to make a meaningful uh, impact on the population, we should uh, uh, pursue. Uh, develop policies and legal frameworks for universal access so that um, you know uh, the service providers are not necessarily limited to only places where they can get uh, economic uh, return, return on their investments but uh, also social investments uh, uh, in this regard. Uh, it's important that we create awareness mm -hmm. of these opportunities. And this meeting is one of those. And I, I, I want to encourage uh, uh, as many of us to do the same in our, in our regimes. And again, secure the digital spaces. People are afraid uh, because a lot has happened uh, in terms of privacy, intrusion, and um, other, other crimes, cyber crime and all. Uh, it's important that we uh, work towards securing uh, digital spaces so that people feeling safe uh, to, 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 to navigate and to work in the digital spaces. Now, role of libraries. Uh, libraries can do a number of things, but I uh, compartmentalize this or categorize this into four. And without reading the finer details, there's um, uh, libraries can and have uh, done some work in capacity building, building the literacy levels of uh, the users, the communities uh, in which they exist. And this should be escalated and mainstream. Uh, there's also a digital uh, inclusion advocacy. And this has not happened very well, but uh, it is happening still at infancy level. It's important that uh, there are advocacy uh, uh, towards ensuring that everyone is included, issues to do with taxation, for instance, that that could go down, issues of safety and, uh, and, and, and others that would ensure that uh, digital uh, rights of, of, of people, especially this generation, are, uh, are secured. And uh, libraries could also spearhead access to digital resources or provide access or expand access to digital resources. And of course, uh, there are many libraries already doing that, acting as hubs in the communities where they work. And uh, it's important that that is mainstreamed and uh, even as escalated. <clears throat> Resource mobilization, uh, there's a lot that uh, is uh, not uh, possible to do because of uh, uh, low uh, resources. Um, and it's important that libraries could take up a responsibility of uh, you know, mobilizing resources from funders out there and being able to you know, uh, create, uh, for instance, infrastructure in their communities or uh, content uh, or, or train uh, people in the communities as, as a means of uh, encouraging them to utilize digital spaces. And lately we're talking about the gig economy, uh, creating work. And of course the library is already training people on how to work in the digital spaces uh, remotely. But again, uh, that could be improved. Now, uh, a few examples before I exit. One is a, a very good example in, the, in Uganda, digital skills uh at your uh, library local library uh, project which is basically uh addressing issues of uh, digital literacy and also you know creating awareness about spaces uh, the spaces themselves how best to use them and um well, the opportunities that, that that are out there and again opening their spaces for the communities to be able to use to access uh, digital spaces uh, more affordably and so this is a very a good uh, uh, project. I, I, I've listed the link down there and a few photos of what is happening, but you can see that um, uh, some work is being done in terms of uh, building capacities and increasing uh, access to uh, digital spaces uh, in the Republic of Uganda. 
In Kenya, also a number of uh, initiatives have, have, have been there. I'll mention uh, the Kenya National Library Service, uh, particularly the Nakuru branch, uh, that has uh, conducted a lot of, uh, uh, of, of programs or initiatives that relate to uh, uh, opening spaces and uh, building capacities of, of, of individuals. Uh, and mentioned the, the first one where they are uh, you know, having free short courses on uh, basic uh, skills like um, on, on computing, on web design, uh, social media communication, and uh, reaching out to pupils um, so that uh, li digital literacy is introduced uh, to people uh, while they're still young. And um, even teachers uh, as trainers of trainers and youth are some of the most excluded people and uh, even senior citizens, people who are either retiring or close to retirement or have just retired and um, are in the villages, um, not having much to do with their time, yeah, they could uh, be able to uh, be more productive with digital skills and uh, a lot of opportunity for them, for their experiences, particularly those of them who are working in uh, the gig e economy. And so there are a number of digital uh, literacy programs in academic libraries. Uh, almost all academic libraries are having this uh, uh, alongside the usual digital literacy uh, skills uh, that, that, that we have, information literacy rather. And um, one of the universities, um, Kabarak University in the center of Kenya has a digital literacy day. Uh, I thought that was a very uh, good one as a way of promoting uh, awareness. And of course, most of the libraries, uh, academic, public, and community are also serving as digital hubs where people are able to uh, go and use uh, uh, library uh, resources. There are many other uh, initiatives, but I would summarize them uh, by saying that the majority of them are, um, are based on uh, improving digital literacy uh, in Tanzania, um, in, in, in Rwanda, and uh, uh, in, in, in other countries as well. And there is uh, uh, something that is unique, again, in Rwanda, there are digital ambassadors uh, who have been uh, appointed to champion issues that are relevant uh, to digital inclusion. So that is part of uh, the advocacy that I was talking about earlier. Now, what are the key observations? One is that uh, commendable efforts have been made and they should be sustained. And I've also observed that most of the efforts are being made independently. So libraries mainly working as individual entities. Of course, we have a, a unique cases here and there where libraries are uh, working together with other libraries, uh, KNLS in Akuru working together with Kabarak University, for instance. But a large number of the initiatives are single entities. So it means that visibility and impact is fairly uh, localized and limited. And again, many of the projects focus on digital, uh, digital literacy, yeah, and, uh, and, and the provision of, of, of digital content uh, through e-resources, for instance, and access to infrastructure. But I've also observed that in terms of advocacy, networking, and alliance building uh, on matters, uh, digital inclusion, uh, there's very little which is visible. And um, again, there's also very little effort uh, in terms of uh, production of digital uh, content, uh, particularly local content. And um, again, there is less attention that I've observed in terms of promoting uh, the gig economy. Uh, this is platform or digital work, uh, you know, work that can be done online remotely, uh, whether in terms of uh, you know, digital uh, content creation or even uh, the usual consultancy is being done remotely, and uh, not much is, is being done uh, uh, about that in the uh, projects that I've been able to sample. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that brings me to the end of my uh, presentation. I've had to rush uh, very first, uh, knowing that there are more presentations to be made, and also to create time for question and answer. Uh, with that, um, taking back the floor to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, and also just to appreciate what you covered. Uh, literally, it was uh, based on the fact that you start, you first start by explaining what digital inclusion is, and then the causes of digital exclusion, and the consequences and the mitigation, and also the role of uh, librarians in the whole spectrum. So, uh, colleagues, what we will do 
Uh, if you have some questions for Prof, I think there's an icon just on the on the screen at the uh, 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 in, 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 towards the end, and then you can put your question and answers there, and then Prof will answer them as we go along. So uh, I guess at this point we will take our second speaker, uh, who is representing the South Africa region. His name is Dr. Salubi Ogeneri. I think I've pronounced your name correctly, sir. You can go ahead. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, please can you just confirm if you can hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you, Dr. Salubi. Please go ahead. So, just trying to get my screen shared on moments. And good afternoon, um, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to um, speak on this um, topic, for inviting me. And um, I'm Morgan Arasalubi from the University of the Western Cape um, here in South And I'm going to be speaking on digital inclusion. Um, the first speaker has actually covered, so um, I'm actually going to be skipping through more of the localized content focusing on Southern Africa. Um, this is um, supposed to be a 15 minutes presentation, so um, this might come to less, but um, um, we'll take it from there. Please, can you just let me know if my screen is visible as well? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you very much. And um, thank you once again. So I'm covering the Southern African region, um, but here apparently you can see the Saudi country and some of the countries which are not geographically within um, the Southern African um, um, region, for example, Tanzania, which geographically is in East Africa. So not all countries are geographically in, in Southern Africa, um, but I'm going to be focusing more on, on South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, um, countries that geographically are represented within the South African sub-region. And of course, within, um, within digital inclusion, the challenges that we have are not just um, um, localized to Southern Africa alone. Most of these are also found in many parts of, of Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and um, other regions in the world as well. But of course, when it comes to digital inclusion, which um, the previous speaker has actually made um, a good justification of describing, most of the challenges abound in the sub-Saharan African region. So, of course, when we talk about Southern Africa, we basically uh, talking about what we have in Southern Africa alone, but all of these could be spread across the sub-Saharan African region and, of course, other parts of, of the globe as well. Now, Southern Africa, like many other regions in the world, we face significant challenges in terms of um, digital inclusion. And despite the progress that have been made um, in increasing access to technology in the region, um, there is still a long way to go to ensure that, you know, everyone has access to um, basic digital services and skills that are needed um, to effectively participate as digital citizens. Um, and the democratic process is, is also um, hindered in, in the kind of um, gig economy that we are operating and the fourth industrial revolution that is already upon us. So um, citizen participation is actually going to be hindered 
without digital inclusion or without this challenge actually being, being tackled. And one of the main challenges which is also facing the region is um, the issue of digital divide. Again, digital divide is, it's not going to be equally distributed al among all of the regions. Some regions have made better progress. For example, when you look at South Africa, for example, infrastructurally, we have one of the best um, um, connectivity um, on the continent and in, in, in Cape Town, for example, where I am, um, the connectivity is comparable to what you have in most developed countries. But again, this isn't equally distributed across all countries within the Southern African region or across all city or all places even within South Africa. So of course, um, when we talk about the digital divide and trying to enable this digital inclusion, we might be talking about um, empowerment divides. We, we um going to be looking at um, 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 economic divide and of course usability divides are also going to be there and again these are not going to be equally distributed among all of the regions or places not even within countries and of course many people um, in the southern African region uh, reside within the rural areas which are also low-income communities um, and there is no access to reliable internet and, and digital devices. So of course, um, librarians, this is more like um, a, a, court, a clear court um, role that um, libraries and librarians actually um, would actually need to fall in. But all of these actually look more like um, um, more obvious. There, there are other aspects as well, which I'm going to be speaking to as, as I go on, which um, in some ways um, require both tra training on the part of the librarians and also um, librarians using that or in libraries and information centers using that as an opportunity to also promote digital inclusion. So all of these is making it difficult to access information and also to participate in the digital economy. Again, um, the projection um, um, in the next um, um, 10 years is that more people are going to be city dwellers, urban dwellers than rural dwellers. So all of those are also gonna be creating um, a, a whole lot of um, um, strain on infrastructure if, if those infrastructures are not actually, um, if those infrastructures are not improved upon and, and, and all of that. So the inequality also may, may actually just exacerbate and this only limits opportunities for such things as education, such things as employment, economic growth, um, and, and, and also, um, the disability actually just um, gets exacerbated. Now, uh, some of the challenges that we we face with regards to digital inclusion, which the previous speaker actually um, touched on, but when you look at it from the Southern African region, we actually have more languages. We don't speak one language. Um, a case in hand, in South Africa, we have 11 official languages in South Africa alone. So unlike some regions, for example, like the East African region where um, Swahili is widely spoken across countries, for example, in Tanzania and Uganda, within um, the Southern African region, uh, there are not um, many languages that are spoken um, there is no one language that is spoken um, very widely across the region. This might be the case in, in countries, but not really along, um, along the region. And of course, um, um, we're not expecting librarians to become polyglots, but um, um, with, with, with expertise and, and, and having um, knowledge of the language that could actually come in, in, in areas of such as translation of those resources into more indigenous languages to actually enable access um, and, and all of that. So this can actually be um, provide or bring about a difficulty in the provision of digital services. Um, I wouldn't want to dwell on this because the previous speaker actually spoke on this already within the Eastern African region. Also, um, digital literacy is also another challenge that many people in the region um, that the lack, um, so the skills and the knowledge. So this would come in around um, the usability divide. So it's not it's one thing to have the technology available, um, but it's also another thing to to be able to utilize these resources. Now, um, 
Africa and, and Southern Africa inclusive, we have a very young population. So we really don't have much challenge with regards to the use of these devices. But um, literacy then comes in with the kind of information that is to be consumed as well, because it's, it's not just to be digitally inclusive. You also want to be, um, you also want to, the, 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 the level of literacy, not with regards to use now, but with regards to consumption of the resources to also be inclusive, um, because misinformation and disinformation um, can also, with the availability of, with the much availability of, of, of information and resources, misinformation and disinformation can actually create a whole new level of, of, of digital exclusion. Um, so all of those uh, librarians actually have more like a clear cut um, um, role to, to, to play. So what can librarians do just, just to um, wrap this up? Um, for the sake of time. Um, one, we can actually promote um, um, policies um, such as universal service um, fund and um, e-strategies so around um, infrastructure and policy formulation on, on ICT infrastructure. Um, we can also go on advocacy um, and, and making sure that our communities are not uh, just places that um, we provide spaces for to come and read. We also want such spaces um, to, to be vibrant and, 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 and engaging. Um, we, we can participate in policy design in the implementation of these policies, um, enough of, of, of the standing by, enough of, of leaving the job to those who are in parliament alone to, to, to actually um, do, we are the ones that, that connect with the grassroots. Impact evaluation of the resources that we already have an infrastructure that is already available. All of these are ways that um, librarians can actually promote um, a universal service uh, uh, to, to our communities. Libraries can become center for digital um, excellence in their communities. So um, moving into the fourth industrial revolution, which um, is already upon us and, and the kind of economy that we um, currently operate, we want a situation where libraries are able to, to verify data for accuracy and the veracity, especially open data which is um, very important for, for citizen participation in, in governance. Um, today, people, you, you, you can actually constructively create something with data. And with the same data, you can, you can destructively create something as well. So, and, and as librarians and, and library and information centers, we can actually do a very good job in making sure that um, especially open data and this will um, come in particularly with regards to public libraries are verified such as such that citizen participation in governance is, is, is promoted. So um, libraries fostering environmental sustainability through open um, um, data digital inclusion. So what this actually looks similar um, to, to the um, the last point, we actually here looking at such things as um, using open data, for example, to design um, literacy programs tailored towards community needs on sustainability. So um, we we not just going to um, talk about digital inclusion, the environment is also very important. And with the available data to, to librarians, um, for example, if you look at agricultural data, many um, of these rural areas and rural dwellers that we have, um, all they really care about is basically, I just want to eat and I don't care. Um, I need foil um, um, and wherever the foil actually comes from to, to create that meal or I need um, food, however that food actually comes. So librarians can actually use all of the available open data to design such literacy programs that are tailored towards um, the needs of the community, especially on sustainability. And, and, and these trainings could also, would also come in handy on, on data analytics as well um, on the part of librarians and using that to, to create a more, um, digitally inclusive communities in, in the communities that, that libraries actually function in. I also want to talk about 
um, um, data citizenship. So I'm um, just going to make an example of um, the city of Cape Town, which is one of um, the very first cities on the continent to have um, an, an open data uh, portal um, for the building of, of smart cities. So um, in preparing um, the economy and preparing the people and preparing um, Africa in general and within the Southern Africa region for um, the fourth industrial revolution, smart cities are 18. And now we're talking about the internet of things and all of that. So librarians can actually promote um, data citizenship, um, civic data for building of smart cities. This requires inclusive um, communities, democratic um, citizenship participation. And libraries definitely have a role to play because um, facilitation of access to these um, um, open data um, can actually be run by librarians as well. So in, in closing, we definitely need um, um, to close this gap as, as librarians. So let's imagine a continent where technology empowers every person where, where digital literacy is the norm and where everyone has equal digital access to, to opportunities and benefits of the digital age. As information professionals, we this is actually the Africa that we can make efforts to create. Um, and by working to bridge the gap that stands in our way to, to digital inclusivity in Africa. Although we cannot do it alone, that's definitely uh, um, a given, but we have the power to inspire and to make it. So let us not shy away from the work of, I'm not a politician, I'm, I'm not a parliamentarian. Um, um, let us, let's embrace it with open hearts and a determination to succeed. Together, we can create a brighter and digitally inclusive future for all by taking these challenges with pride and purpose one step at a time. We, we have the power to shape a better future and it starts with us um, making efforts towards bridging these gaps. So let's Let's be the one to make the difference. Let's lead the way and pave the path for progress. It's time to pick our roles as librarians and make Africa digitally ready and inclusive. Thank you. Uh, sorry about that, colleagues. Um, our moderator, Ms. Bongiwe, must be having some technical glitch. Uh, colleagues, allow me to step in as we wait for her to bounce back. At this point, I would like to invite our third presenter, um, who is Mr. Antonin Diof, representing West Africa, Frank Fon. Uh, Antonin, please take on the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues, uh, all attendees uh, from all around the world. Um, I'm supposed to talk to you about the examples of uh, digital inclusion led by librarians uh, here in West Africa, in the Francophone uh, area of Africa. Uh, so there is also a language challenge. Uh, I am supposed to talk to you in French, <laughs> but don't worry, my presentation is uh, already bilingual. So from time to time, it's, if need be, I can switch to English uh, to explain more 
what I'm saying in French. So without uh, wasting a lot of time, let me share my presentation. Uh, so my presentation will be a bilingual in slides, but uh, delivered in French, as I said uh, earlier. Um, with, when it comes to talk about uh, digital inclusion and the role of libraries, I think that uh, African libraries are always uh, in the way, are, they are already in the way, and we'll see uh, why I'm saying that. And what we should do or emphasize now is to, to implement what are the ideas uh, going around digital inclusion and who's my, which my two previous uh, presenters have already uh, went around. So let me switch in French, <laughs> please. Donc, euh, collègues, je vais euh, partager avec vous donc, euh, ma vision de ce qu'est l'inclusion numérique euh, dans un contexte euh, de bibliothèque africaine. Donc, à la suite de mes collègues euh, qui sont passés, euh, vous verrez que les problématiques qui sont exposées par ces personnes sont presque les mêmes donc, pour moi. Mais moi, je vais plus m'apesantir euh, sur les exemples donc, euh, pour gagner du temps. So, colleagues, I... Uh, I'll be, uh, I'll try to be brief as possible to, and when then I'm going to lead you to my examples, knowing that my previous colleagues are, have already uh, uh, said what is essential to know when it comes to talk about uh, digital inclusion. But for me, um, there is a late motive. Il y a une lettre motive de la bibliothèque africaine, c'est de ne laisser personne, aucun Africain en retrait, donc dans ce monde numérique, cette galaxie numérique que nous sommes en train de vivre. Donc pour arriver à cela, j'ai identifié quatre mots clés, donc ce que j'appelle la franchise numérique, donc la littératie numérique, que mes collègues ont déjà mis en avant tout à l'heure, l'incubation digitale, la gestion du handicap, et ce que j'appelle euh, la promotion des réalisations régionales. Donc, c'est des choses qui ont déjà été euh, théorisées et mises en pratique dans le contexte numérique africain et que nous, bibliothécaires euh, africains, devons aider à promouvoir. Donc, euh, j'y reviendrai plus tard. So, my uh, presentation, the examples I give to you will be, uh, will be focusing on uh, five keywords I uh, identified what I call uh, digital exemption, digital literacy, uh, digital incubation, disability management, and promotion of regional fulfillments. So I'll go in details uh, when you come to, uh, to, 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 to explain what is, what is going around these uh, keywords. La franchise numérique uh, telle que je la conçois, donc, c'est des bibliothèques euh, qui sont comme des espaces euh, Internet gratuits. Donc, toutes les bibliothèques doivent être des zones franches d'Internet. Et une gratuité, donc, pour naviguer sur le web, euh, accéder à des contenus, donc, se former, euh, accéder à des contenus en PDF ou en, en mode audiovisuel. Un endroit, donc, où on trouve tout et à propos de tout. Donc, un lieu aussi de production, d'édition, de fourniture, de contenu euh, sous une forme et dans une langue appropriée, y compris les langues africaines, donc comme l'ont comme dit euh, mes collègues euh, tout à l'heure. Euh, donc, euh, les bibliothèques africaines doivent être ces zones franches, donc euh, du numérique, 
et cela de revoir PIE. Donc, c'est quelque chose qui doit être pratiqué au jour le jour, donc avec des politiques euh, éprouvées, donc euh, qui vont jusqu'à épouser même la réglementation, si le besoin se fait sentir. La, la littératie numérique, euh, c'est faire des bibliothèques aussi euh, des lieux pour apprendre à trouver, évaluer et communiquer des informations euh, par le biais de la saisie et d'autres médias sur diverses plateformes numériques. Il s'agit pour euh, nos usagers de les aider à comprendre ce que sont les outils des technologies de l'information et de la communication et surtout comment les utiliser de manière appropriée, donc sachant que le monde actuel avec son foisonnement numérique est véhicule aussi de, de nombreux contenus qui peuvent ne pas être les plus adéquats ou bien les plus appropriés dans un contexte personnel ou collectif. Et c'est tout ce qui touche les fake news, toutes les mauvaises informations. Donc, euh, qui circule sur le net et sur le web. L'autre aspect, c'est l'incubation numérique. C'est de faire des bibliothèques, donc euh, des lieux de promotion, de l'innovation dans le domaine d'éthique en Afrique, donc en particulier les jeunes, donc qui sont au premier stade critique de la création ou du développement d'entreprises liées aux technologies. Euh, L'idée ici, c'est de vraiment faire de, des bibliothèques, euh, des lieux d'incubation, c'est-à-dire euh, permettre de disposer de, de, de outils qui sont mis à disposition de facilité pour permettre à des jeunes, donc ça peut être des, des étudiants de, de département d'informatique ou bien des citoyens lambda qui sont intéressés par euh, la création, de pouvoir faire euh, des bibliothèques, des lieux d'invention, donc qui sont liés au numérique. Ça peut être le développement d'applications mobiles, etc., etc. Le handicap aussi, au-delà même d'être de, une données d'inclusion sociale euh, épouse aussi euh, l'inclusion numérique. Parce que quand on parle d'handicapé, on parle d'handicapé visuel, d'handicapé moteur, euh, d'handicapé euh, auditif. Et le numérique doit être accessible donc, à tous ces, toutes ces personnes-là. Donc, quand on parle, par exemple, d'handicap visuel, le fait, euh, par exemple, de, de rendre nos sites web les plus accessibles possibles, euh, par les caractères qui sont pris par le jeu de couleurs, permet à des malvoyants d'être plus à l'aise pour accéder aux contenus qui sont proposés par, par le web. Et ça aussi, euh, nous, bibliothécaires, euh, en formatant nos outils d'accès à l'information numérique, nous devons de plus en plus nous mettre dans cette position de pouvoir rendre disponibles ces outils pour que ces handicapés, de quelque nature que ce soit, puissent être à l'aise euh, dans le processus d'accès à l'information numérique. Donc, ce que je disais par rapport aux promotions des réalisations régionales, c'est toutes les constructions qui sont faites euh, au niveau africain, donc euh, qui permettent de rendre plus visible la présence de l'Afrique dans le monde numérique actuel. Je crois qu'il y a une initiative qui mérite d'être encore mieux promue par les bibliothèques notamment. C'est le DOT Africa, donc, qui est le nom de domaine, top, le nom de domaine pour euh, des sites web ou des, des, des pages web qui sont construites ou hébergées en Afrique par des Africains et pour, ou pour des Africains. Cela permet dans un sens statistique de pouvoir mesurer à sa juste valeur quel est le poids de l'Afrique, par exemple, euh, dans le web, donc en termes de contenus qui sont partagés, en termes d'applications, en termes de sites web, etc., etc. De la même façon, euh, dans nos pays, euh, j'invite les bibliothécaires africains à de plus en plus aussi euh, utiliser les top global des noms de domaines pays, euh, par exemple, le point .sn pour le Sénégal, point .ml pour le Mali, point .ci pour la Côte d'Ivoire, pour la bonne et simple raison que si moi, bibliothécaire, euh, je mets en place un opac, donc un catalogue en ligne, et que je n'utilise pas mon nom de domaine national, euh, il se pose quelque part un problème de souveraineté numérique. Et j'y reviendrai quand je parlerai de cela dans les exemples. Donc, euh, tout ceci étant dit, la chose la plus importante pour moi à mon niveau, c'est comment mettre en œuvre tout cela. Nous connaissons tous les problèmes, 
Donc, euh, ce qu'il faut, qu faut faire, à quoi il faut arriver. Mais comment le faire Ça peut poser problème. Et je pense que c'est mieux, c'est très bien qu'on que, 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 qu qu fasse un peu le focus donc, sur cette façon de faire. Donc, euh, pour les cinq mots clés que j'ai choisi, moi, de mettre en œuvre, de mettre en exergue dans cette présentation, j'ai mis quelques bullet points donc, euh, qui euh, sont liés à, à, à la façon d'implémenter ou bien qui donnent des idées sur comment euh, ces, ces, ces mots-clés-là peuvent être euh, mis en œuvre par les bibliothèques. Donc, ça va de agir sur la législation nationale, donc on parlait tout à l'heure d'advocacy, donc de, de, de plaidoyer, euh, d'utiliser des sponsors pour euh, arriver à ça. Donc, euh, par exemple, dans chaque pays, il y a des, 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 des compagnies de, de, de fournisseurs d'accès Internet qui, par le biais de la bibliothèque, peuvent, dans un partenariat gagnant-gagnant, se rendre visibles et permettre à la bibliothèque d'économiser de, des coûts de connexion à Internet, par exemple. Donc, euh, c'est des, des stratégies qu'il faut mettre en place et qui, euh, auxquelles il faut penser. Pour euh, la stratégie de littératie numérique, digital literacy, donc, euh, comme toujours, c'est les formations, c'est des séminaires, c'est des séances de tutorat. Donc, la production de manuels, handbooks et surtout de la visibilité euh, communicationnelle en utilisant des médias, par exemple, pour toujours, euh, à partir de la bibliothèque, donc, intéresser le grand public à comment accéder à l'information numérique de la manière la plus safe possible. Euh, L'incubation numérique aussi, euh, c'est du mentoring. Donc, euh, c'est de faire des bibliothèques, des open space, des, des espaces ouverts. C'est aussi euh, faire de la formation à ce niveau, etc. etc. Donc, euh, je ne vais pas trop m'apprésenter sur euh, la mise en œuvre. Je vais passer directement aux exemples. Donc, comme exemple euh, de franchise numérique, euh, c'est de contourner la difficulté de, de connexion Internet. Donc, on sait qu'en Afrique, ce n'est pas toujours évident d'avoir une connectivité pérenne et durable, même dans les bibliothèques. Et une, 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 des, une, une des solutions est de trouver des, des systèmes qui permettent de faire de l'Internet sans Internet, si je peux m'exprimer ainsi. C'est des dispositifs d'accès offline donc, où euh, les usagers à partir de la bibliothèque peuvent se connecter à ces serveurs centraux offline avec des contenus qui sont déjà mis là-bas et qui sont mis à jour euh, quotidiennement ou d'une façon épisodique euh, selon des, 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 des politiques ou des policies. Donc, euh, ces, ces dispositifs sont déjà, ils existent déjà. Donc, euh, le Combook, il est là depuis 2015. Donc, euh, actuellement, il y a le système Cajou aussi qui se branche sur un ordinateur portable un smartphone et qui permet à l'utilisateur d'accéder à, à des contenus. Donc, l'idée ici, c'est d'avoir une bibliothèque donc, euh, qui acquiert ces outils-là et qui peut partager euh, des ressources euh, pour ses usagers euh, en local. Et même dans une perspective de décentralisation, de pouvoir euh, intéresser, par exemple, dans une approche systémique, des populations ou des usagers qui sont dans l'environnement immédiat de la bibliothèque, qu'ils soient alphabétisé ou qui ne soit pas alphabétisé, cela supposant que les contenus numériques soient aussi bien en langue officielle qu'en langue vernaculaire. Donc, euh, c'est des choses sur lesquelles il faut penser. L'autre exemple lié à la littératie numérique, donc, euh, c'est par exemple ici un exemple de conception graphique avec un outil qu'on appelle Photopea, donc qui est un outil gratuit et puissant de création graphique, donc qui est un équivalent valable de Photoshop. Là, l'idée est quoi C'est que le monde numérique aussi, c'est un monde qui est payant, donc qui est très cher, euh, des fois, et pour lequel euh, le citoyen lambda ou l'usager n'a pas toujours euh, les possibilités d'acquérir euh, ces applications-là. Donc, la bibliothèque, son rôle à ce niveau serait de tout faire pour que ces outils-là soient disponibles déjà, d'une façon ou d'une autre, mais que surtout, euh, des séances de formation puissent être, des séances de sensibilisation d'abord, puis de formation puissent être faites pour les usagers, non seulement pour qu'ils connaissent ces, ces outils-là, mais qu'ils puissent les utiliser et en tirer le, le meilleur parti. Donc, euh, un autre exemple, c'est la formation d'élèves de classe de terminale, donc euh, sur la culture numérique. 
donc pour les autonomiser dans l'utilisation de ces outils. Pour l'incubation numérique, donc euh, toujours un exemple euh, qui est tiré euh, d'un centre, je vais revenir à ce, sur ce centre-là après, c'est des concours de développement d'applications mobiles en ligne, donc euh, par groupe de deux ou trois élèves qui travaillent sur un projet. Donc là, c'est vraiment faire de, de la bibliothèque euh, ce qu'on appelle le euh, genre de Fab Lab, où les gens apprennent à forger donc, euh, des applications. Aussi, euh, des ateliers de codage informatique. Donc, c'est des choses qui se font depuis, depuis très longtemps maintenant, depuis une vingtaine d'années. Euh, mais le but est de faire de, de, de la bibliothèque aussi des espaces où, au-delà du public euh, cible, donc intéressé, par exemple, si c'est une bibliothèque universitaire ou académique, euh, tout l'environnement immédiat des, des, des collèges pour les attirer à la bibliothèque avec euh, l'appui d'un département informatique de l'université, par exemple, à aider euh, les jeunes élèves à comprendre ce qu'est le codage informatique, sachant que c'est une force, c'est une porte euh, incontournable pour en faire demain des programmeurs ou des développeurs. Et je crois que l'Afrique a aussi besoin de ce, de ce genre d'initiative de, 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 là pour euh, asseoir son inclusion numérique. Et là, je parlais aussi de la, donc, de la souveraineté numérique. Donc, le fait d'utiliser des, 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 des initiatives qui sont déjà éprouvées, euh, non seulement l'utilisation des noms de domaine, donc le dot Africa, j'ai donné un exemple ici, d'une bibliothèque, euh, je crois qu'elle est privée. Bon, elle n'est pas en Afrique francophone, ni en Afrique de l'Ouest, mais je pense que c'est un exemple qui peut être impactant euh, de ce que le dot Africa peut représenter en termes de souveraineté. Et j'ai partagé en fin de compte aussi la bibliothèque numérique de Côte d'Ivoire, euh, qui a inscrit donc, son, son adresse URL en utilisant le dot CI, donc, qui est le nom de domaine de la Côte d'Ivoire. Donc, c'était en résumé les exemples que je voulais proposer. Bon, c'est que ça, cela implique pour nous, en fait, euh, l'inclusion numérique. C'est que les bibliothèques euh, doivent se donner l'ambition de se numériser complètement, donc dans leur organisation, leur administration, leur fonction technique, leur service au public. C'est-à-dire utiliser un logiciel de gestion intégré, donc on appelle ça MRP en anglais, euh, qui intègre toutes les fonctions de la bibliothèque, donc qu'elles soient des fonctions administratives ou des fonctions techniques, ce qui entraîne de facto que les acteurs de ce système-là euh, puissent adopter des comportements digitalisés et donc automatiquement inclusifs. Et en fin de compte, on ne peut pas parler d'inclusion de, 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 numérique en Afrique sans parler des opportunités que l'Afrique elle-même a actuellement. Et ces, ces opportunités, euh, il faut les connaître, il faut les savoir et les utiliser ou bien se donner la force, donc en puisant, en, en, se, en se référant à ces opportunités-là, de mettre en œuvre tout ce qu'on vient de dire. Et c'est des données factuelles, donc je vais présenté pour vous donner un peu une idée de ce que l'Afrique a déjà comme acquis et qui rejoint un peu le titre donc, de ma présentation. Quand je titrais l'Afrique en marche ou les bibliothèques africaines en marche, c'était un peu lié à ça, c'est qu'il y a des opportunités qui sont là et qui sont peut-être mal connues ou méconnues et qu'il faut mettre à contribution dans le process. Donc, c'est les statistiques de 2022, datant de 2022. Où donc là, on voit que euh, la, la pénétration de la, des réseaux fibrés, donc en Afrique entre 2015 et 2021, on est actuellement à 669 millions de, de, de personnes donc, impactées, soit 57% de la population sub, Afrique subsaharienne. Donc euh, c'est plus que la moitié donc, euh, en taux de pénétration. Euh, la couverture de de la, de, 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 du réseau 4G pour les mobiles en Afrique subsaharienne de 2015 à 2021. Donc là aussi, sont, les chiffres sont très parlants. Donc ils ont atteint 540 millions de, de personnes. Et pour qui connaît l'avantage qu'offre l'utilisation du mobile pour les bibliothèques, euh, c'est une donnée qu'il faut prendre en compte et de plus en plus euh, axer nos services aux usagers. Euh, dans l'utilisation de ces technologies numériques pour euh, intéresser le plus grand nombre euh, d'usagers. Donc, la même veine aussi, euh, le nombre d'abonnements smartphones, donc en termes de provision, 
entre 2011 et 2027. Donc là, j'ai en jaune les projections qui sont prévues pour 2027, c'est-à-dire 798 millions de personnes impactées donc, euh, dans l'utilisation du smartphone. C'est énorme. Et pour le coût actuel, actuellement, nous avons 503 millions d'abonnements euh, sur smartphone en 2021. Euh, un autre média qui peut être mis à contribution, c'est ce qu'on appelle la télévision euh, par accès IP. Euh, ce n'est pas très, très euh, connu en Afrique francophone, surtout en africaine que je connais mieux. Mais c'est des, 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 des outils aussi que la bibliothèque gagnerait à, à cibler. Et, et là, dans le design, par exemple, de, de nos opaques, de nos catalogues en ligne, de nos bases de données et autres, permettent que C est, c est, ces dispositifs soient accessibles euh, dès la maison. C'est-à-dire un usager d'une bibliothèque, par exemple, euh, qui a une télé à, à, connectée à Internet, donc euh, une Smart TV, puisse à partir de sa maison accéder à, à, à la bibliothèque euh, numérique d'un pays, d'une de, 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 institution, d'une localité, et sans même se déplacer. Donc, euh, et enfin, donc, tout ce qui est euh, statistique liée à l'usage d'Internet en Afrique, avec des prévisions, la situation actuelle euh, prouve à bon escient que l'Afrique est actuellement dans, sur le chemin, donc non seulement dans l'infrastructure, mais dans l'utilisation aussi de cette infrastructure-là, sans compter l'usage des médias sociaux qui peuvent aussi être et qui doivent être des relais importants pour les bibliothèques euh, pour euh, favoriser cette inclusion numérique-là. Donc, euh, voilà euh, les présentations donc, euh, que je voulais faire et les exemples. En vous remerciant tous donc, euh, de, votre, euh, de votre attention. So, colleagues, uh, sorry not uh, having done all the... Uh, presentation in French, but I think that uh, with these uh, bilingual slides, uh, you have got uh, the, uh, the, the, the essential uh, message uh, that, I, that I wanted to share with you today. So it's my turn to thank you for your attention and waiting for questions. So Madam Chair, you have the floor, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Antonin, for this insightful presentation. At this point in time, I'd like to invite Stephen Weiber to at least share with us a few key highlights from the presentation so that we are not excluded since we are handling <laughs> digital <laughs> inclusion. Thank you, Stephen. Well, so it, 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 it's definitely always a good thing that the Anglophones sometimes get to realise that what it's like for everyone else in the world when we do everything in English all the time. So merci beaucoup, Antoine, for, for your presentation there. Um, I really don't want to take take, take long in, in, in summarising. And, and as Antoine said, clearly everything's been up in English on there. I think you know, the data in there is really powerful, the, the, the indication of the opportunities that there are, the the scope that there is. And, and I think a point that certainly we agree with and that you made very clearly is the fact that digital inclusion is, it's complex. Um, mm -hmm. It isn't just about getting people online. It's about helping people to, to make use of the fact of being online, but actually that exactly as you said, libraries are actors, libraries can cut through that complexity in a way that actually does promote, um, that does promote inclusion. So there's a really powerful story to tell. There are really powerful examples and, and, and you gave some of, of, of the, the possibility for libraries to make content available, to no, <laughs> simply to make the internet into a place that it is worth visiting. Um, that's, that's some of the ideas behind the exemption, the importance of, of literacy and giving people the skills, but also the, the awareness of their skills and so the confidence of doing it. Um, of incubation, of using it to actually realize potential to do things that wouldn't otherwise be possible. And to sort of overcome, through overcoming the digital divide, overcome some of the other divides that we have in our society, in particular that between people with disabilities and, and everyone else. Um, 
there's so much that we can do and that again this is you know, there's so much potential it is complex but as libraries we are very well equipped to deal with that complexity i think i'll stop the summary there because it's good that you actually hear from that people have and there are questions coming in and and yeah back to you sarah uh, thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, at least I'm sure everyone is on board now. And at this point in time, I'd like to invite Ms. Comfort Asare from Ghana uh, to share with us what you have to do. Uh, Comfort, you are welcome. Have I lost comfort? Ah, uh, okay. As we wait for uh, comfort, comfort come doesn't appear to be on the our yeah, colleagues. Uh, as we wait for comfort to uh, maybe come back online, can we have questions coming through? She was online. I think something happened, and then. It dropped off. She could be back within some few minutes. Uh, colleagues, we have 22 minutes. We uh, comfort requested for 10 minutes. So the 10 minutes can be used for Q&A or any other contributions that you may have that the presenters might have left out. Okay. I can see comfort in the um, attendees list. So. I think she may have to be moved to the panelist list. Oh, okay. Uh, Stephen, would you like to be of help here? I've, I've just moved her up, so hopefully she will reappear as a panelist. Okay, thank you. Imminently. Yep, she should be back with us now. Uh, comfort, sorry about that. You should be fine now. Good afternoon to you all. Good afternoon. Yes, and um, thank you so much um, for this um, opportunity to do this presentation. Um, before um, I go on with, um, the, with the presentation, I would like to say that um, I'm doing this on behalf of um, Dr. Monica Mensah. She should have um, done this, but unfortunately there's been some emergency and she's unable to join us um, for this presentation. So this is something that I've, um, I've put together and then um, I'll try and then make it as brief as possible. Um, the topic that we are looking at now is a um, role of libraries and digital inclusion. And before I go on, a brief outline, I am going to look at a brief um, definition, how we can um, foster inclusion um, in our libraries. And then some of the areas that is of uh, much concern to us, and then we'll also go ahead to look at some of, of the initiatives, the role of libraries, and some of the institutional, as well as the government um, initiatives that we have, and maybe one or two points on going um, forward. So when we look at the definition by the United Nations, it says that digital inclusion is um, equitable, meaningful, and safe access to use, lead, design, and digital technology service and associated opportunities for everyone and everywhere. This means that whatever I'm going to talk about briefly um, this afternoon will be based on this um, definition. Now, the issue now is how can we foster and promote innovation um, within digital um, inclusion? The first that we have to look at is um, we have to look at the needs of our users because at the end of the day, these are the people that we are going to serve. So if we don't take their needs into consideration, I wonder the kind of service that we are going to give out to them. And then also we should be able to improve access to whatever information, whatever resources that we want to put out there. And also we should be able to motivate people to make use of these um, resources. And in talking about motivation, you can look at it from so many angles and then it will come up as we, we go on with this presentation. And also we should be able to work with others. Um, there's, um, there's a saying that no man is an island, no institution is an island, and no library is an island. So we should be able to collaborate and then work with one another. And also in going forward, we should also focus on the wider outcomes. And that is uh, how do we measure performance? If we say we want to get ourselves in digital inclusion, at the end of the day, we should be able to have some kind of a benchmark. How do we measure it? 
Are we performing or we are not performing? Then moving on, let's also look at some of the areas of concern for us as information professionals and all. First of all, we have to look at the infrastructure setup. When we talk about digital inclusion, it's about infrastructure. The question now is, do we have it? Is it available? If it is available, how secured are the systems that we have in place? Because if the systems are not well secured, I believe whatever we try to do to, for our users, people can get the chance, hack into the systems. We may also have viruses coming up to maybe frustrate or distract whatever we want to do. And also we should be able to look at um, the cost of infra infrastructure. When you look at where we are coming from, we know that the cost of infrastructure is very high. And when we narrow, narrow it down to our various institutions, the question now is what percentage of the budget has been made available for um, all these um, infrastructure? Is it there or it is not there? Then we also have to look at some of the frequent updates that we have to some of these technological platforms and the need to have them updated. It's also one thing that we have to look at. And also in looking at um, digital inclusion, are we looking at the online or we are looking at the in-house? This is something that we have to also um, look at. And then one other thing that comes out strongly is the changes in ownership of some original companies to some of these platforms that we need and we use. They also come up with new pricing models. How do we handle that as institutions, as libraries? Going forward, how do we look at that? And then I believe that when it comes to infrastructure, they are most of the time we do have um, this underground cables and the issue of thefts, I believe it is not just um, limited to Ghana. When we go beyond the shores of Ghana, um, some of these issues are day in and day out and um, reported. So the question now is what measures do we put in place to be able to salvage some of these um, cables that we need to be able to run our systems effectively. Then in looking at the technical needs, um, when we are talking about uh, digital inclusion, we are also looking at the library staff, the personnel that we use. And some of these staff, they are not prepared. They are not prepared to adapt to changes. So the staff that we are going to use, are they willing, are they ready to adapt to any changes or whatsoever? And if they are prepared to do that now, from the staff, we come down to the users that we are serving. What is their literacy level like? Because based on some backroom monitoring that has been done, we see that there's poor or low usage of the resources that are available. So what is the literacy level of the users? When I talk about the users, I'm looking at the student first, and then we can still narrow it down to the faculty that we are serving. How literate are they? And if they are not, if the faculty members are not, if the users are not, if um, our personnel are not, do we have any training programs in place that can help them to come up with some of these um, 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 skills that they need to be able to access the resources that are available? And also one major issue that we are battling with now is um, power outages. If we don't have persistent or constant power out, um, supply, I believe the issue of digital inclusion will not be able uh, to work. I believe, um, I think about two years ago, the issue of um, COVID-19 exposed most institutions. We realized that we didn't have the platforms. We didn't have the needed or the required bandwidth to, to sell out or to, to, to extend some of the informational resources to uh, various users. And then also, when you look at the cost of data, for even personal use to it is very, very, very high. Now, the question now is, in looking at some of these challenges and the issues that I have talked about, what is the role of libraries? I think I've already highlighted on um, the training. So the first major point we have to look at is capacity um, building. And this is for our staff. I've already talked about it. The next one, we look at our users, and then we also look at our faculty. Then um, if I should still bring it down to, to, to our contest in Ghana, for instance, when you take the, the library association, we do organize um, training for our users, our um, librarians, and how best they can also extend those um, skills that they have acquired to their various users. And just it's not just the Ghana Library Association. We also have the Consortium of Academic and Research Libraries, Consortium of Academic and Research Libraries in Ghana. Also, 
um, bringing or uh, bringing up some of these training um, programs for um, for users, and also the African Library and Information Association and, and institutions. They are also playing a major role when it comes to capacity building. Then another area that we have to look at when it comes to the role of libraries is about resource um, sharing. When we talk about resource sharing, we have to look at the electronic databases, and we also look at our uh, OPAC the online public access to catalog, online public access catalog. I believe most of us, it is just limited to our institutions. It is not a national one. So if you are looking at digital inclusion, can we at any point in time come together, bring our resources together so that at least people can have access to these resources that we have? Again, um, the consortium is playing a major role and the association is also playing a major role. And then let's also look at some of the initiatives that are available. At the institutional level, I know that most institutions do provide Wi-Fi um, wi to so, um, their users, be it students and um, faculty and all. And then when you now still come down to the um, government level, in Ghana here, I'm going to cite a number of initiatives that the government has put in place that I believe it is working. And then the libraries or information centers can also write on the back of these initiatives to be able to reach out to our users. The first is um, that um, telcos in Ghana offered free packages to support and um, free packages of data to support um, the fight against um, COVID-19. And some private institutions have also provided 10 gig of data to support they are users. Again, uh, you can also say that Vodafone Ghana, which is also another telco, has provided um, free data to over 50 institutions in Ghana. And then the, Ghana, uh, the government of Ghana also has rolled out a free wiper project. And as we speak now, about um, 13 public institutions have also gotten connected to this platform. And then at a point also, Free Wi-Fi was introduced to um, most um, senior secondary schools in Ghana and most of these institutions to have a libraries. And I believe that this is something that can also spearhead um, the, the need to push out information resources out to the users. And then there's also another um, initiative that the government has also introduced through the public um, library system. And they have offered um, virtual trainings to thousands of librarians both in Ghana and beyond the shores of Ghana. Then, then going forward, what can we do? Looking at some of these concerns that have been raised, we have to know that there's the need for more collaboration. We don't have to just concentrate on the resources that we have as an institution. As I said, we can remain as an island. We need to co collaborate. We need to come together. We need to share the resources that we have and then move forward again we should be able to have a, a policy on digital inclusion. If we don't have a policy on this, I wonder how we can push this agenda forward. And also we need to educate more on the need for digital inclusion in Africa and then beyond. There should be more opportunities for an um, advocacy. And if we are able to do this, I believe um, our role as information professionals in pushing for this digital um, inclusion can be a success. On this note, I'd like to thank you so much for your attention and I'm ready for any questions that may come up. Thank you. Uh, that is really wonderful. Thank you so much colleagues for all these presentations. Uh, reading through the chat, I can see everyone is appreciating. Of course, we had some exclusion with the language but we were warned earlier in the first presentation. So we take that as something to fix very fast. Um, our colleagues, I'm, I'm waiting for your questions. Even if it's one or two, the presenters are eagerly waiting to respond to these questions. Yes, sir, I can see two people raised their hands. Uh, oh, Bongi, please take over, take over. I'm happy you here okay but i can't see their names from my end maybe the first one should just shoot in and ask a question from my end i'm seeing two people uh, i see betty namome betty are you able to speak
Okay, let me just quickly give her rights to talk. Okay, Betty, there you go. Please ask your question if you can, and please be brief. Betty, are you ready? Ah, I can go to the second. Hello? Okay, she's ready. Yes, please go ahead. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Professor. I would like to appreciate the last presenter. In fact, my question was on um, <clears throat> access of resources. Sometimes some resources are not for free. She has answered it that uh, there is need for collaboration in sharing such resources, having policies. Yes, for them in, uh, in Ghana, they have opportunity of the fiber optic where the internet is very accessible. What about us here in Uganda? We need also our government to enforce our government to put in more services so that people in every area can access information. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I can see a second hand. Please unmute and you speak. We are only taking two in the interest of time. I can't see the second hand on my side. I'm only seeing Betty's. So I want to take it that all the questions have been handled. Stephen, do you want to say a word or two before we close? I simply to say we'll, we'll look forward to assuming all that the that all of the participants the, the speakers are happy to share their slides we can definitely share them up on share them up on on the website i think i know that Antonin went to uh, impressively produce bilingual slides and so i think a lot of the content of what he said is in there so that will overcome that one i'm constantly need to close though so i really don't, I don't want to be the one responsible for for taking this longer okay uh, thank you so much, dear participants. Uh, I must say uh, this has been oversubscribed. We've had 127 of you in this space. Uh, when the French language came over, then we dropped up to 1-1. One, one. But that's okay still. Uh, it makes us um, uh, be uh, fit for any language and be ready for whatever circumstances. Without further ado, I want to say good day to all of you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, team. Bye. Thank you.